Well, welcome, dear friends, to another session of Bible Plus Online. This is session four in a series entitled I Am. And the significance of the term I am uh, comes from the use in the Bible of the phrase I am as the name that God gives to himself. And we first come across this in Exodus chapter 3, where we have the famous account of Moses encountering a burning bush in the wilderness where the bush is not consumed and he approaches it and God's voice comes from the bush and tells him to take off the, the shoes from his feet for he was standing on holy ground. God, of course, gives him a job to do and that is to go down to Egypt where the Israelites were in slavery and to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. Moses at first is very reticent about doing this and asks God, who shall I say sent me? And of course, God says, say, I am has sent you, or I am that I am, this great phrase telling us that God is the source of all being. It reminds us as well, of course, that God is not a God who stays hidden. He's a God who chooses to reveal himself to us. And we're told in the scriptures that the very universe that God has created is a revelation of himself, that we can see his majesty, his wonder and his glory in that. Uh, but of course, we also know that God tells us things that we can't understand by just using our senses, things that we need to know about who he is, about who we are and his purposes for his world. And that comes through the scriptures, what we call special revelation. And of course, the most perfect revelation that God gives to man is in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. He is the perfect revelation of God because, of course, he was God incarnate, God in the flesh. So God as the source of all being was a focus of our first session. And we asked the question, asked by philosophers over the millennia, of why is there something rather than nothing? And we looked at the four possibilities of either that Everything that we think is there is an illusion, or that the universe created itself, or that the universe is self-existent and therefore eternal. But we found that there were real problems with those three. The final one, though, of course, is that the universe was created by something that is self-existent and therefore eternal. Um, we pondered upon that and recognised that that self-existent thing must have agency if it desired to create something. And the only things that we know have true agency are minds. So really, we shouldn't be talking about something that is self-existent, but someone. And that is how we get our ontological argument for the existence of God through that. Well, this phrase, I am which obviously God uses as his name and is translated as Yahweh in the Old Testament, is a phrase that Jesus in his ministry takes to himself using the Greek form of ego eimi. And this series is focusing upon the seven great I am statements that are recorded in John's Gospel. And when he used them, his critics, really, they understood exactly what Jesus was aiming to do by using this phrase. He was claiming to be God himself. And that's why we find that when he uses this phrase, well, in one case, where Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, they picked up stones to stone him as a blasphemer. We also focused on Jesus' use of language. And in his I am statements, he's using analogy. He is trying to communicate spiritual truths about himself and his purposes to physical human beings, us in other words. We started off by looking at where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And we unpacked what Jesus was trying to convey by using this statement. And we recognise, of course, that light shows us the truth. And the idea of light in the scriptures, we refer to the fact that it says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, that the truth that God wants us to see primarily is who he is and his nature. And truth is absolutely pivotal to us to understand about God. God is not a man, it says, that he should lie. And that truth, from God's perspective, is objective. Whatever we think about a matter there is the objective truth of God himself. 
not only does light shine truth upon who God is, but it also shines truth on who we are as well. And we find through this process that, firstly, we're not like God. We are a created creature, not the self-existent creator of the world. It also shows us, of course, that we have a problem and that is that we are infected by sin. That although we are formed in the image of God, that that image is marred by sin. That goes to the very core of who we are. And that is why we need God's help, God's mercy and his salvation if we are not going to be destroyed by judgment. Well, Jesus then turns it round and reminds us as well that we are to be the light of the world. We're the, supposed to be the people who walk in truth, who shine God's truth into the part of the world in which we live. Last time we looked at the statement, I am the bread of life which Jesus uses in the teaching that follows on from the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And in his usual way, Jesus starts off with a physical thing that people could see and people could understand part of their everyday experience, namely the bread which they eat. And the, obviously the bread, the food that Jesus had provided for them so miraculously the previous day. But he then moves them to an understanding of the concept of spiritual bread. He makes the analogy that, of course, physical bread gives us physical energy and the resources to grow and, or repair ourselves as well. And he makes the point that spiritual bread provides you with spiritual life, spiritual resources to allow you to grow spiritually. His hearers find this difficult to understand, but what Jesus was trying to get them to realise was in fact that he personally was the spiritual bread, and that unless Jesus was inside them, his life was inside theirs, then they had no life in them. So we have this process where Jesus showing that just like we take bread and place it into our stomachs to give us life, likewise, Jesus was going to come and needed to be inside them, this process of internalization, if they were to have spiritual life. This process of internalization and identification can be seen in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We are given bread and wine, and we're told not just to look at it and to recognize it as being symbols of Jesus' body and blood, but we were told to eat it, to drink it, to consume it, that it may become part of us, within us, and in so doing give us life. Well, today's session is entitled Shepherds, Sheep and Doors. Well, we're the sheep, and of course Jesus is the shepherd, and we'll understand what he means by I am the good shepherd and I am the door by following this session through. In the time of Jesus, Israel was still a pastoral society, Lots of flocks roaming the hills, and surprisingly enough, the shepherds were seen as the lowest of the members of society. This is, in a sense, paradoxical, because in the history of Israel, there is definitely a place for what we would call the shepherd king. And we can think of, for example, David, the most famous king of Israel up to that point, who had started his life as a young man, being a shepherd protecting his sheep from predators. Moses himself, when he approaches this burning bush at this time in his life, is again a shepherd looking after the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. And we find as well that when we come to some of the great prophets of the Old Testament like Isaiah, this idea of the coming Messiah being like a shepherd comes on several occasions. One of the most famous ones, of course, is from Isaiah 40, where the coming Messiah is said he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. What a stunning picture that is. 
It's also interesting, of course, that when we come to the Incarnation, which we celebrate every Christmas, the first people who are told of the coming of the baby are shepherds abiding in the field, watching their flocks by night, as we know. So God gives them the honour of seeing the glory of the angels celebrating in heaven, and they have the honour of going and worshipping the Christ child and being the first to do so. And so we come to Jesus' teaching on the phrase, I am the Good Shepherd. It's found in John chapter 10, if you fancy opening your own Bible and following it through, but it will be on the screen. There's some symbolism that obviously is going on here. Jesus is obviously the Good Shepherd. and But the sheepfold here is God's kingdom. Some commentators in this passage see two sheepfolds as being there. The first one that we come across being the nation of Israel that contain some who are truly God's people and others only appear to be. The suggestion is that there is a, a second sheepfold, Jesus' own sheepfold for his own sheep, his own flock. This is analogous to the true kingdom, the kingdom that only can be entered by Jesus' own sheep. And the first section of Jesus' teaching is about how do you get into this sheepfold? And of course, there is one legitimate way in, and that's the door. And the gatekeeper, of course, is God the Father. The sheep are ordinary people like you and I. But there's two groups of sheep here that Jesus talks about. It says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So there are those who belong to his flock of sheep and those that don't. This would have been a very common sight in Israel at the time. There was often at the edge of a town a sheepfold where several flocks might be kept overnight to keep them safe from harm. This sheepfold is analogous to the nation of Israel, as we've mentioned. In the morning, each shepherd would go and would call his sheep from the mix in this large pen. And those who belonged to that shepherd would recognise the shepherd's voice and he would lead them out. They would sort themselves out. Those that didn't recognise his voice would stay where they were. But those who did recognise his voice would follow him and they would go off for the pasture for the day. So in this part of the passage, Jesus emphasises who are his sheep? What is their prime characteristic? And their prime characteristic is firstly that they hear Jesus' voice. They hear the shepherd's voice. They recognise who is speaking to them. One of the most interesting points of this section of the passage is it says that Jesus calls his sheep out by name. They're not just an amorphous mass of sheep and each one is known individually. And obviously if we take that to ourselves, Jesus knows us and calls us individually by name. And the second characteristic of the sheep is having heard, they then follow. The third characteristic of Jesus' sheep is that they do not follow other voices. This teaching, of course, Jesus is giving to his hearers. But we have this usual situation that they hear, but they don't understand. They can't make that transition from the physical, which was well known to them, to the spiritual, which was not. Jesus then changes tack and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. We know that wherever Jesus uses the phrase truly, truly, or verily, verily in some of the older versions, he is wanting his hearers to take very special note. In essence, he's saying, this is true truth, as true as you can get. In the time of Jesus, many of the sheepfolds, which were up on the hills possibly, didn't have but what we would recognise as a door. Instead, 
when the shepherd had herded or taken the sheep into the sheepfold of an evening, he himself would lie down at the opening of the sheepfold and would become literally the door of the sheep. The shepherd, in one sense, literally became the door for anything or anyone to get in or out of the sheepfold. They would literally have to go through him. The thieves and robbers that Jesus is referring to in this passage is probably the false prophets that had come before him, or possibly the false kings as well. Jesus then reinforces this picture of the sheepfold as being God's kingdom and him being the way through into the kingdom is reinforced. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. So in this teaching, Jesus is making the point that it's through him that we enter the kingdom. He is the only legitimate route into God's kingdom. If you know your scriptures well, you'll remember where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus is saying that he is the way, the exclusive way to the Father. All other teachers, all other religions, however appealing they are to the wisdom of men and women, they are false because they don't work. You can't get to God through them. So Jesus is telling us that through the work that he came to do, he was going to become a way for sinful human beings to enter into God's kingdom. And again, he contrasts himself as the good shepherd with other leaders who were there. He described them as being thieves who've only come to steal and kill and destroy and exploit the sheep. In contrast, Jesus has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. And again, looking forward to how Jesus was going to become this doorway into life, this doorway into God's kingdom. He says the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We know that when Jesus repeats something in his teaching, he does so for greater emphasis and it reminds us that when Jesus does that, we need to take really good notice of it. We find in verses 14 and 15 that Jesus repeats this phrase, I am the good shepherd. And then he repeats this vital, vital factor about those who are his sheep and those who are not. He says, I know my own and my own know me. This vital living bond between the sheep and the shepherd. This vital living bond between the believer and their saviour. Jesus tells us that this knowing, the quality of this knowing, is profound. He says, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, so there's something about the way we know Jesus and he knows us, that is so profound that Jesus compares it to how he knows his father, and his father knows him. And the characteristic, again, which makes Jesus the good shepherd is obviously he cares for his sheep, but it's this principle which goes right through the New Testament of the fact that Jesus shows his love and his care for his sheep by laying down his life. The way Jesus was going to help us sinful sheep to come into his kingdom was going to require the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, or what is often called the Passover Lamb of God, who Jesus was. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus being the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. There is this concept that runs through the Old Testament and the New Testament of God's people being like sheep who have gone astray, every one to his own way. And we find that, of course, in Isaiah 53 in Jesus's parables. We have the parable of the lost sheep and Jesus going to find the lost sheep. 
So this idea of, of sheep being lost and needing to be found is clear symbolism of us as being sinners who are lost, being saved by the Good Shepherd. Well, some commentators over the years have suggested that this teaching is primarily aimed at the nation of Israel. And Jesus, in some of his teachings, said, I have come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So can we still look at this imagery and take it upon board ourselves if we are not a member of the Jewish people? Well, we're given great encouragement because in verse 16 of John chapter 10, Jesus again moves gear, changes direction. And he says this, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And that is referring, of course, to people who were not Jewish, not of that fold. But he says, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. This is one of the clearest indications in Jesus' teaching that what he was about to accomplish through his death and resurrection was not just for the people of Israel, but it was going to have an effect that would ripple out through the entire world. And we see, for example, in the book of Acts, how although the initial gospel is preached to the people of Israel, that very quickly that spreads outwards and we have people like the uh, Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul taking the good news of Jesus out to the wider, what we would call the Gentile world. That this was a very important part of Jesus's plan is brought out by his use of the word must. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. This idea that until he brings in those who are his from the Gentile nations, that his mission is not complete. He also prophesies that although Israel had been very hard of hearing and didn't understand but that there would be many who would be in the Gentile nations who would listen to his voice through the teaching of the apostles. The outcome of all this is that rather than having a special nation, the Jewish nation, being distinct from the rest of the world, which we see through the Old Testament, we see this breaking down of the boundaries, the breaking down of the barriers, joining together these two flocks to become one flock. So now we understand that God views us as being either part of Jesus's flock or not part of his flock. He doesn't distinguish between Jew and Gentile. And Paul teaches that we are all one in Christ Jesus and that the hallmark of being a child of God is having Christ by the Holy Spirit living within us. Well, this teaching about the Good Shepherd finishes with Jesus saying, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. God's love is expressed here in the person of Jesus by his willing sacrifice for the life of his sheep. This is the perfect expression of the son's obedience to the father. Where is Jesus willingly laying down his life, knowing that when the job of redemption is done, that he might take it up again. Remember that Jesus says, no man takes my life from me. He willingly lays it down, willingly takes it up again. There may be some of you who are listening to this session who are in church leadership yourself, where you, in a sense, are a shepherd and that you have sheep to look after. And the characteristic that we find, of course, and that demarks a true shepherd from a false shepherd is that we are to lay down our lives for our sheep not to do our own schemes and ideas, but to live sacrificially for the well-being of those who are entrusted to our care. We are under-shepherds of the great Good Shepherd, that we fulfil our ministry in a way that would please God. 
Well, this is a great theme, isn't it? And we today have only been able to touch the outlines of this marvellous topic. And I hope that you are able to spend some time just meditating on this particular passage of Scripture and that God will show you greater depths from it indeed. Next week, we're going to look at Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life. So until next week, may you listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd. And when you hear it, follow him. Till next week, God bless you.